Hey friends, this is Visionary 3D, focusing on the future of 3D graphics. Ray tracing is fascinating to me. Not only because it gives us realistic results compared to other rendering techniques, but because it's so much more intuitive and much more beautiful. Recently, I've been learning WebGPU, which is a new graphics API for the web, and it's really exciting because it's unlocking a lot of possibilities with giving us access to compute shaders. I want to create a simple game using this amazing technology, but the problem is that in order to do that, we need a rendering system, and right now, we don't have one. So in this video, I'm going to make a ray tracing render engine, and I'm going to make it look as good as possible. I'd like to finish my game before AI takes over the world, so I'm going to give myself only 7 days to finish this rendering engine. I don't know what to expect, but I'm excited to start this project. When I start any new project, I never start from scratch, and I've been a fan of Sebastian Lake for a long time, so I thought his video on ray tracing is perhaps the best starting point. Ray tracing starts with this simple question. What is light? In real life, when you turn on the lights, electricity runs through a thin wire and then that wire starts glowing, and it emits small packets of energy called photons. These photons have the properties of both waves and particles. For now, let's assume that light is actually just a bunch of particles. The moment a photon gets emitted, it goes and hits different objects in the room and it bounces around for a while until it hits the camera sensor. From what I've been able to gather so far, when a photon hits an object's surface, it gets tinted by the color of that object. This is because the object always absorbs some of the light and the reflected light color is what the surface rejects. The goal in ray tracing is to track the path of the photons and their color when they collide with the camera sensor. Now, for a 60 watt light bulb, the amount of photons that get emitted is this. That's 10 million trillion photons per second. Instead of thinking about the photons, let's think about their path and let's represent these paths by rays. One big problem with trying to simulate all the rays of light is that most of the rays are going to miss the camera anyways, because the camera sensor is super small. So we're going to apply our most important optimization trick, which is shooting the rays from the camera and not the light source. We're going to shoot a ray for every single pixel on the screen, and to do that, we're going to write a program that's going to run for every single pixel on the screen. This program is called a shader, and you can think of it as a function, which takes the pixel coordinates as the input and gives us back the color of the pixel as the output. This shader is called the full screen pixel shader, and it's exactly what we built in my previous video. So now, with having a basic understanding of how ray tracing works, I think I can start to implement this. If we render the scene with a couple of spheres and one giant light source in front, this is what we're gonna get, with the number of bounces set to 1. As you can see, not all our rays reach the light source, and so we have a lot of dark areas in the back. But if I check the parts where the light is directly hitting our spheres, you can see a lot of rays are able to reach the light source. Now this looks a little bit boring and doesn't look good in my opinion, so how can we fix this? Well this is all we need to create a good looking ray tracer. And I was surprised a little bit at first, but the only thing that you need to do is to repeat everything we've been doing a couple of times. Meaning, let's do more than one ray for each pixel and let's increase the bounce limit to something higher. And boom! Now the image is still a little bit noisy and I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to find a way to denoise it later in real time, but for now, a simple trick that I'm going to use is to just blend between the current frame and the previous frame and just take an average. And after a couple of seconds, we get a pretty good result. Now, so far I've been just copying the logic from Sebastian's video and it looks great, but hopefully we can do something new and unique today. If we take a look at the image after a couple of seconds, I love the diffuse reflections and the shadows, but the result doesn't look fantastic to me, and I think something's missing. This wasn't obvious to me at first, but to see why, we're gonna have to go back and take a look at some of the assumptions that we made earlier. We assume that light is just made by a bunch of particles, but the reality is that light acts as both particles and waves. Let's look at a pool of water divided into two parts, with a small opening in between. Now, if you create a simple wave in the first part, what do you think will happen when the wave reaches the opening? 
What happens, as you might have guessed, is that the wave diffracts into circular waves. And this is exactly what happens with light. When light passes through the camera's aperture, it diffracts, and that causes bright objects to have a glow effect. I learned this by watching this video from Anj the Great, so the missing piece is perhaps Bloom. I want to do this thinking that Bloom is going to be an easy effect to implement. It's just a post-processing effect after all, and we've just implemented ray tracing. And the hard part of this project should be already done, right? Well, there are tons of ways for implementing Bloom, and obviously I tried to look online and see if there are any web GPU implementations of it yet, but unfortunately for a new API like this, there aren't that many things available, and we need to build pretty much everything on our own. So I spent the whole yesterday figuring out which blooming method gives us the best result. And after watching these two videos from Simon Dev and the Cherno, I noticed that everybody's pointing to the same thing. This C graph presentation on how Bloom is implemented in Call of Duty Advanced Warfare seems to be a good resource for learning the basics. The first thing that we need to do for adding Bloom is to take the image and blur the bright parts a little bit. After we do that, we can add the blurred image back on top. This is the foundation of what we need to do, but there are a couple of challenges that I'd like to address. The first problem is separating the bright parts of the image. If you just take the bright pixels and apply the bloom on those, then you'll have the problems that the games in the 2000s had. Everything that's white will basically have bloom, which obviously isn't realistic. Those games were using an 8 bit per channel buffer, which basically means that for each color channel of the image, you only could store 256 values per pixel. But today, you can use high dynamic range formats and store way more information in the color buffer. 10 bit floating point buffers count as HDR, but scratch that, I'm gonna use 16 bit float color buffers like what Unity does. Okay, our first problem is solved. The next step is to just blur the image. Sounds easy, right? Well, the thing that makes this step difficult, which I wasn't able to really understand at first, is that if you just blur the image using a box blur, you apparently get aliasing artifacts and weird results. And while this is based on no actual research on my part, this is what's in the Seagraph presentation. So to get Call of Duty Bloom, which looks smooth and beautiful, you'll have to downsample the image a couple of times and then upsample it a couple of times. But there's a problem. I don't have any idea of how to downsample and upsample, and I'm not even sure what those terms really mean. Yesterday, I did more research and didn't really write a lot of code, and you might be able to even say I've been procrastinating a little bit, and I think the reason for this is because I feel like there are huge gaps in my knowledge right now. One very useful idea that's helped me in the past is to never start anything from scratch. So I'm going to try to copy this article from learnopengl.com and get something working on the screen. The first thing that I need to understand is what a MIP map is. A MIP map is a set of textures which are basically the same with different resolutions. So let's say you have a texture and you have the resolution of that texture. That means that you've downsampled your texture by one level. So downsampling simply means having the resolution and upsampling means you double the resolution of your texture. I'm going to be implementing these two things using compute shaders. A compute shader is a function that runs on all the points in an imaginary grid. This imaginary grid can be 1D, 2D or 3D and the input to this function is the index of the point on the grid. Now I'm going to make a compute shader specifically for downsampling our image which takes a texture as the input and another texture to write to as the output. What we need is a way to pick and choose the color of each pixel in the output texture from the input texture, which you can apply by doing one texture sample. But this creates some pulsating artifacts and stability issues. At first, people were doing four texture samples instead of one to get better results for the bloom, but the Call of Duty folks said, scratch that, we're gonna do 13 texture samples instead, and we're gonna average the results based on these handcrafted weights. One key thing here, which I ignored at first, is multiplying the point's coordinates by 2. Because imagine having the resolution and running the shader for half the amount of pixel points. If you sample the input texture with the same coordinates, you're going to get half of the image. So if you just multiply that by 2, you can shrink the texture down and sample correctly. This is the same as multiplying a function's input, which you've seen in high school. Because when you multiply the domain by a constant like 2, the pattern simply shrinks. 
I'm gonna run the down sample shader a couple of times, having the resolution every single time while making the shader right to the specific MIP level that I want. But the difficult thing about this is that WebGPU doesn't have a read and write texture. So I have to create two textures called ping and pong and ping pong between them, which means swapping the input and the output texture every time I'm downsampling. Using this function, I know exactly how many times I need to downsample until I reach a one by one texture. And from that point, I'm gonna start upsampling. We upsample progressively, which means we go from MIP level six to five to four and so on, and we don't skip any MIP levels. This time, the filter that I'm gonna use takes nine samples, and I'm gonna take an average based on these weights. This time you need to divide the pixel coordinates by two because we're upscaling and dividing the domain of a function by two will cause the pattern to expand. Now, one important thing is that I might be able to find a better way to do this later because if we just multiply by two and divide by two, we might get some rounding issues. But for now, I think this is fine. Now, if you do the things that I said correctly, you're gonna get this. And I'm sure you'll agree that this isn't what we expected. Even though we still have some issues to fix, I think we're on the right track. Now, what is the issue here? Well, the key part that I actually missed when I was reading the presentation was this. Progressive upsample and sum the chain as you upscale. What this means is that you have a texture with a MIP chain with your downsample textures in it, and when you're upsampling, you need to add the previous MIP in the chain like this. And once you're done, you can add the blurred image back on top of our original render and then apply some tone mapping to get that high dynamic range in the range of 0 to 1. I also added a pre-filter shader which allows us to selectively choose where we want to bloom our image based on the brightness of the pixel. I also spent some time adding this timer helper, which gives us information about the speed of our algorithm. And the bloom pass is currently running at 0.1 milliseconds of GPU time. And the ray tracing pass is running at 3 milliseconds of GPU time. And this is tested on an NVIDIA RTX 4070 Ti. I'm happy with the results, but man, building the bloom alone took nearly five days of my week. I wasn't expecting this to be so difficult to implement. Regarding the ray tracing, I am planning to make it real time with some denoising techniques and I'm working on those right now, but that's another topic for another day. All the code is up on GitHub and here are the resources that helped me get here. I thank all the people that are producing such amazing content like the Cherno, Simon Dev, Ace Rola, Sebastian Leg, Ange the Great, and everybody who's doing good work like this. I thank you again for watching this video all the way through the end and with that, I'll see you guys in the next videos.